Welcome. I'm Steve Tackett of Grace Bible Network. We are very pleased to welcome you to this video class. We are proud of the quality of Grace Bible Network's online Bible studies and recordings available on both our website and YouTube. Whether you watch them online or just listen to the audio portion on your commute to work, we are glad you're here. Please enjoy the recording. Okay, welcome to the Tuesday night Bible study. And what we're going to do tonight is start a new series of messages from the book of Galatians. So we're going to go verse by verse to the book of Galatians. But before we actually get into the text of Galatians, I want to cover some preliminary ground just in case there's anybody listening that's not familiar with uh, the biblical definition of apostleship and understanding right division. So we're going to be looking at those two things to start off with. We're going to be looking at the apostleship of the Apostle Paul and what it means to be an apostle, what are the qualifications, and then we're going to talk a little bit about right division. Then we'll actually get into the text of Galatians. So let's begin by turning to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we read in verse 1, And Saul, that's Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, and Saul, yet threatening, or excuse me, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. In verse 7, it says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So Saul of Tarsus sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say in verse 8, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen a vision of a man, hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, and he that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all they call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this is when, of course, the Lord appeared to Saul of Tarsus, and Saul of Tarsus is converted, and the Lord makes him the apostle Paul. So when you uh when you're looking at Galatians chapter one, you might as well go ahead and turn there. 
when you're looking at Galatians chapter 1, uh, you notice that it begins in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised them from the dead. So Paul is making the point that he is an apostle, and he's not an apostle by men, not of men. He wasn't made an apostle. He's not a self-appointed apostle. No, he was made an apostle by the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus Christ himself. Christ spoke to Paul, appeared to Paul, and gave him a message and a ministry and an apostleship to the Gentiles. Look at Romans chapter 11 Romans chapter 11 in Romans chapter 11 he says in verse 13 for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles I magnify mine office so Paul is, it's very clear, the Lord Jesus Christ made Saul of Tarsus an apostle and made him specifically an apostle to the Gentiles. This is very important, as we'll see as we go along in this study. So what does, since we're on the subject, what does the word apostle mean? What does that mean? Apostle. Well, apostle is from the Greek word uh, apostolos, which simply means sent one, one who is sent. And it's, but it's more specific than that because it's because we're all sent to preach the gospel. We're all sent to to share the gospel with others. We're all sent to glorify and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. But to be sent as an apostle, that's a very special calling. That's a very special sending by the Lord. Uh, look with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. When the Lord Jesus Christ made apostles of Peter, James, and John, and the others in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he, 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 he made them apostles, and he gave them a very specific ministry and message, just as he gave a very specific ministry and message to Saul of Tarsus. He gave a very special uh, message and ministry to his apostles that he made while he was ministering to the nation Israel. So look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. So these men who were his disciples are now, he makes them his apostles. Then he names the, the 12, and of course that included Peter, James, and John. Then he says in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth. So now he's sending them. You see that word sent there. He's sending them because they are apostles. He's made them apostles, so he's sending them out to do a specific work for the Lord. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So the first thing he commands them as apostles is not to speak to Gentiles. Verse 6, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
So their, their message in ministry is to only the nation Israel. Verse seven, and as ye go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely give your seed, freely give, and so on. Gives you more instructions there. So they have a very specific ministry and it's only to the nation Israel, it's not to Gentiles. And it's the preaching of the kingdom of heaven and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But I want you to look now to Hebrews chapter three. Hebrews chapter three. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, now notice it's capitalized there, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So Christ himself is referred to as an apostle because he was sent by God the Father to do a very specific work uh, in ministry with the nation Israel. So Christ himself is referred to there as an apostle. Okay, now let's turn to, let's turn to Acts chapter 26. So I read that verse in Hebrews chapter three, just to demonstrate that, that the word apostle simply means sent the sent, a sent one and it uh it has to do with a very special sending it's not just a kind of a general setting it's a very specific special kind of sending from god himself um so now we're turning to acts 26 that's what i said acts 26. Acts 26, and in Acts 26, the Apostle Paul is rehearsing in front of King Agrippa the events that took place back in Acts chapter 9. And he gives more information about what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, communicated to Paul there in Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, it says in verse or uh, excuse me, in uh, Acts chapter 26, verse 13, it says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and said unto me in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So now, what we see there in the apostleship of Paul, we see, we're beginning to see many different things here. We're, we're seeing a difference in the message and who the message is going to. Uh, we saw in Matthew chapter 10, that the message that Christ gave his uh, apostles there was to Israel only, and it was to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and to do signs and wonders. Well, but we see here in these passages that we read that Paul's apostleship 
has a different message and it's to a different group of people. It's to Gentiles, whereas Peter, James, and John's message was only to Israel. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. And you'll notice every one of Paul's letters begins with Paul making the point that he is the apostle called by God, called by Christ, and he's to the apostle, to the Gentiles. And the, and the greeting that you always see in every one of Paul's letters is the greeting of grace and peace. He always adds grace and peace to the opening of his, of his letters because his message is about grace and peace. Paul's message is about all about the grace of God and having peace with God. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in here in a minute. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You see the same thing. Romans chapter 1. Paul, verse. this is verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And then you always see the greeting of grace and peace uh, verse 7 to all that be in rome beloved of god called to be saints grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ so you see that same greeting in every one of paul's letters to the churches now let's turn to the gospel of john and i want to make another point about what it means to be an apostle um, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is a very important point to make. Uh, one of the reasons that I want to emphasize the fact uh, that Paul is an apostle called by God, uh, called by Christ, um, and sent by Christ, uh, just as the other apostles were, is because, the, again, the position of apostleship is a very unique sending by God. Uh, if you look at uh, John chapter 13, verse 20, speaking about the apostles, it, Jesus says in verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me so the again the position of apostle is a very special position because whatever the apostle whatever that apostle is teaching that is directly from god that's not something that uh that that individual is you know, making up as they go. It's not something that they just feel inspired to say, to preach. It is the very words that God gives that apostle to give to his audience. So if, if, if God sends somebody and he makes them apostle and he sends them with a message, you have to accept that message as if it's coming from God himself. Very important to understand. You, if you're going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, because he says there, Verily, verily, I send you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. So receiving so receiving these apostles and their message is equal, according to the Lord, 
to receiving the Lord himself because their message, you know, they're just, they're just mortal men. These, these apostles are just mortal men, but their message is directly from God. It's not to be discounted or criticized or rejected. It is directly from God. It's as good as this God himself is speaking when these apostles are teaching what they're teaching and they're bringing their message to their audience. Very important, very significant. Look at the gospel of John chapter 17. John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and let's start at verse um, We'll start at verse 17, John 17, 17. This is, by the way, this is the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ prays on behalf of his apostles. This prayer is about his apostles. This is not about the church, the body of Christ. This is not about the world. This is about this prayer that Christ is praying in John 17 is about his apostles. And we'll see that. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world you see verse 19 and for this for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me what through their word through the words of the apostles Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. So you see, the, again, the ascending of the apostles is basically in, in, instead of Christ. They're representing Christ on the earth. They are representing Christ. There's no other religious figure on earth that represents Christ more than an apostle. So that's why you can't make yourself an apostle you can't be a self-appointed apostle you can't get up one morning and say i think i'm going to be an apostle or or have somebody some religious guru tell you that you're now an apostle that doesn't happen that's not real to be an apostle you have to have the lord jesus christ himself make you an apostle Christ himself speaks to you and commands you and tells you, you are now an apostle, and this is what you're going to preach. Very important to understand that. So, again, there's a very specific message that the apostles have. The, the message that Peter, James, and John and the other apostles have is different. It starts out where they only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They're not to take their message to the Gentiles. But look at Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Now this is after the resurrection of Christ. And he is teaching his apostles some things and bringing them up to um, 
bringing them up to date on what has happened. Why Christ had to be crucified and raised from the dead. Because they, they had no understanding of why Christ was going to be crucified and then raised the third day. They didn't know anything about that. They didn't understand any of the prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ being crucified and then rising from the dead. They didn't know anything about that until after the resurrection. And in Luke chapter 24, he says, Christ says to his disciples, verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the Old Testament scriptures about his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, and by the way, what does that tell you? If they didn't even know that he was going to be crucified and raised the third day, how can they be preaching the death, burial, and resurrection for salvation during their ministry? Uh, the answer is obvious. They were not. So let's read on. Verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise, the dead, rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. But what? Notice. Now it must begin at Jerusalem. They can preach to this message of the kingdom to all nations, but it must begin at Jerusalem. Look at um, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Again, this is after the resurrection of Christ, just before he ascends back into heaven. And he tells his apostles in verse 8 of chapter 1, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So again, there's the order. They are to preach the gospel of the kingdom as they did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they take it first to Jerusalem. Then they take it to Judea. Then they take it to Samaria. Then they can take it to the Gentiles. Well, they never, they never got out of Jerusalem. If you read Acts chapter 8, the apostles never got out of Jerusalem before God changed his dealings with man by interrupting the prophetic program that he gave to, to Peter, James, and John and saved Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9 and brought in the dispensation of the grace of God. Look with me to... Um, Look with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1. Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a forward few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and that's fellow heirs with Christ, and of the same body, the same body, the body of Christ, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And what is that gospel? That gospel is 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. The gospel that the Apostle Paul was commissioned to preach 
is not the same gospel that the 12 of other apostles were given to preach. The gospel that the apostle Paul preaches, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, that ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul's gospel is, Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And what is your response to that message? Your response should be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the message that Christ gave to Paul is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Your response to that message it should be, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not every cell is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you don't do anything, you don't do any works, you just trust that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That is the gospel that Christ, when he commissioned Paul to be an apostle, that's the message that he gave him. Now, as we get into the book of Galatians, which we will eventually, we will eventually actually get into the book of Galatians, but let me just say, let me just say right now, the main theme of the book of Galatians is the fact that even though the, the churches at Galatia received the message that Paul preached, they received the gospel that Paul preached, they began to mix the law with grace. They began to mix the law in with grace. They began to add elements of the law of Moses into the gospel. Okay, just like a lot of religions do today, they begin to mix it. And that was the issue. That's the issue in the book of Galatians is that they started out believing the right gospel. But then these Judaizers, these these people who believe you have to keep the law came into the churches at Galatia. They infiltrated the church at Galatia and started to convince people in those churches in Galatia that yes, you need to believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and the rose again the third day, but you also have to keep the commandments. And that's the problem. That was the, that's the issue that Paul is addressing in the book of Galatia. Now, um, Let's go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 1. And look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised them from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Notice it says churches, plural, because there's three churches in the region of Galatia. See, Galatia is a region in the uh, around the Mediterranean Sea that is now called Turkey. When you look at a map today and you see that it, you see that mass of land around the Mediterranean Sea called Turkey, well, that was once called Galatia. And in that area called Galatia, there was three cities. And in those three cities, three churches were established. Turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Verse 
those three cities are Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And you read about that in Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they, this is Paul and Barnabas, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds ill-affected against the brethren. So you start to see that, that uh, pattern starting to form of get, trying to get these Greeks, these Gentiles, to, to not fully accept what Paul is preaching. Verse 3, long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And that is Galatia. That region they're referring to is Galatia. So you have three cities in Galatia. So you have three churches in Galatia. The one in Iconium, the one in Lystra, and the one in Derby. So going back to Galatians chapter 1. It says, verse two, and all to and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches, those three churches and those three cities of Galatia. Verse three, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is this. Again, remember that the church at Galatia started out believing the right gospel. But the Judaizers came in and started causing confusion and adding things to the gospel. So we read here in verse uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Then he says, Verse 7, which is not another. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, this is very important here. Because he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Unto another gospel. Then he says, which is not another. I want you to think about that for a minute. Is there more than one gospel in the Bible? There most certainly is. There is more than one gospel. But there's only one gospel that will save you today in the dispensation of grace. But there is more than one gospel in the Bible. If you look at Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, look at verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So there you have the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the uncircumcision. Those are two different gospels. Peter preached the gospel of the circumcision. Paul preached the gospel of the uncircumcision. Well, what's circumcision and uncircumcision? Circumcision is a reference to the people of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation Israel. So it's a gospel of the circumcision. It's a gospel that is that relates directly to the promises made to the nation Israel. So it's very closely related to the gospel of the kingdom. 
but the gospel of the uncircumcision, and uncircumcision is a reference to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were the uncircumcised. They were not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were uncircumcised. So Paul's message is the gospel of the uncircumcision. It's a message of grace that has no part in any covenant. It's not related to any covenant particularly the covenants God made to the nation Israel. So it's the gospel of the uncircumcision because it's a gospel that has nothing to do with the promises made to the nation Israel. It has to do with what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. So going back to chapter one, he says, in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Well, we've already learned that there are more, there is more than one gospel. There's the gospel of the kingdom. There's the gospel of the circumcision. There's the gospel of the uncircumcision. But what does he say in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, that gospel that's, that other gospel that's not another gospel, that gospel that's not another gospel is that perverted gospel. See, that's no gospel at all. That gospel that says, yes, you must believe in Christ that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, plus you have to keep the commandments that's that other gospel that's not a gospel. It is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. That's why Paul said it's really not a gospel at all. It's, there, there's no gospel there. When you say you must believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day to be saved, plus keep the commandments, that is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. So therefore, it's not a gospel at all. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of the circumcision or the uncircumcision. It's not a gospel at all. It's just a perversion of the gospel that Paul preached. So let's read on. Verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. So what is Paul saying there? He's saying, let him be accursed. In other words, Paul is not practicing witchcraft. And he's not playing God. When he says, let them be accursed, what he's saying is that the curse of the law is upon those people who pervert the gospel. The curse of the law. In other words, those people who think you have to keep the law as part of their salvation there is uh, already a curse on them because they are going to be cursed by the law. Let me uh, show you what I'm referring to. Turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter... Galatians chapter 3. I'm sorry for the delay there. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 
Look at verse 10. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. What is that curse? For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, you can't say that that uh, I'm just going to keep, say, the, the Ten Commandments plus believe that Christ died for my sins and that was what, what will save me. He's saying if you put yourself back under the law to any extent, well, you're required to do everything that the law teaches. He says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. If you don't do all things that are written in the book of the law to do them, you're under curse. See, no matter, no matter how you slice it, you're cursed if you put yourself back under the law. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident that for the just shall live by faith. Verse 12, and the law is not a faith. Did you hear that? Let me repeat that. The law is not of faith. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse it to everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ became that curse for us. But if you're like these people that infiltrated the churches at Galatia, and tried to convince the people in those churches that they also had to keep the commandments to be saved or to stay saved. They're under that curse. They're under the curse of the law. Which means they're not saved. You can't be under the curse of the law and be saved at the same time. You either trusting in Christ alone for your salvation or you're under the curse of the law. And if you mix belief in Christ plus the law as the gospel, as these people were doing, you're still under the curse of the law. That's why Paul says in Galatians 1, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Because he is, he's cursed. If he believes, if anybody believes that you have to keep some kind of a commandment, that you have to keep some kind of a rule for your salvation or to keep yourself saved, you are cursed because you're not trusting fully what Christ did for you on the cross. Verse 9, as we have said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. There's a similar passage to where the wording is somewhat similar in um, 1 Corinthians 14. Let me just turn there real quick. In 1 Corinthians 14, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says in verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. See, the idea is the same as we read in Galatians. The idea being that if somebody rejects sound doctrine, if they reject what Paul is saying, if they reject the right gospel, well, then let them be ignorant and let them be accursed. And let them, you know, it, it's their own doing. It's by their choice, in other words. Nobody's making them ignorant 
of sound doctrine and nobody's making somebody be accursed. It's just they're choosing to be accursed. They're choosing to be ignorant. That's the point. So going back to Galatians, I, uh, I kind of skipped some verses there. And uh, I want to go back there. Galatians chapter 1 again, verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Well, it says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now, there's two ways to look at that. One is that spiritually we are delivered from this present evil world. But what do I mean by that? If you look at Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. <laughs> so spiritually, we've been delivered from the power of darkness, and we've been translated spiritually into the kingdom of his dear Son. So in the same, in the same vein, so likewise, in Galatians chapter 1, if you'll go back there, Galatians 1, verse 4, when he says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Spiritually, we've been delivered from this present evil world. And God has given us the power not only from the penalty of sin, he's given us the power over sin in our life. And so we've been delivered from this present evil world in the spiritual sense, but will also be delivered from this present evil world in the physical sense, in the literal sense. Because one day there's an event that Paul talks about all through his letters, all of his letters talk about an event called the catching away, or some people refer to as the rapture. That is where we are, been, we are predestined to be resurrected from the dead and to go up to meet the Lord in the air. And this, uh, this event happens at the end of the dispensation of grace. And this is what Paul is referring to here in verse 4 when he says, Then you might deliver us from this present evil world. Spiritually, we've been delivered from this present evil world. But physically, we'll, we will be delivered from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So we will be delivered. We will be delivered from this world and from the bondage of sin forever. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans 8, 13. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that is a reference again to when we get our glorified bodies at the moment that we're raptured out of here. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and trailed and pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's when we're physically delivered from this present evil world. So going back to Galatians 1. We are spiritually delivered from this present evil world, and we are going to be physically delivered from this present evil world one day. Verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So I'm going to, for tonight, we're going to stop there.
And then next Tuesday night, we'll get into more detail about what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 1. So we'll go ahead and stop for now and uh, take comments and questions. Hello again, hope you enjoyed the recording. If you liked it, would you please help us with our YouTube ratings? Would you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel? You can unsubscribe anytime you like. It helps us reach more people with the teaching of the word rightly divided. For more information on our online Bible classes, please check our website at www.gracebiblenetwork.org. We are a nonprofit entity supported by our ministry partners, and we will never solicit donations. This is God's ministry, and he always provides for our needs. Remember that God's grace is a gift itself. Freely given us through his son, his grace is sufficient to save you from all your sins. But only if you have faith in what Christ has already completed for you on your behalf. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Thank you very much.